floods and famine, tornadoes and war, an airplane crash or an earthquake. Natural disasters and man-made catastrophes, events that can cause enormous loss of life, destruction and hardship. In desperate hours, you'll become an eyewitness to some of the most noteworthy disasters of the last 100 years. The Earth really moves in this episode as we look at one of the most devastating of all natural cataclysms, the earthquake in all its destructive power. Of all the natural disasters we'll look at in this episode, none release more sheer destructive energy than an earthquake. After all, it takes a great deal of the Earth's energy for two of its magnetic plates to grind against each other long enough that they go snap and jolt the planet's outer crust for hundreds of square miles. with great sadness, the great horror and heart-rending aftermath of the 2015 earthquakes in Nepal. The April 2015 Nepal earthquake, also known as the Gorkha earthquake, was responsible for over 8,000 deaths, with injuries many times over that. suffocating inside. I couldn't breathe. People die inside the, I mean the dead body inside the house. It's a nightmare. Yet even in the midst of such widespread tragedy, there are beacons of hope. A teenage boy is rescued from the rubble. It's what we call an entombment. So he wasn't specifically crushed, but what he was was inside of a box, a box with, with heavy concrete all around him. So the, the US, USAID teams, uh, what we did is we worked side by side with the local teams, and we were there to assist them uh, in getting this victim out. Across vast swathes of Nepal, entire villages were flattened, rendering hundreds of thousands of people homeless. Centuries-old buildings were obliterated at UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the Kathmandu Valley. The April 2015 earthquake also triggered an avalanche on Mount Everest, killing at least 19 and making for the deadliest day on the mountain in recorded history. We saw huge pieces of rock and ice coming down from phases of Makalu right over there over Camp 2. Well, I'm pretty well fucked. Uh, I fell through that hole. Thankfully, I didn't keep falling that way. I got trapped here instead. With this ledge, my arm I can't use. Sign of distraction. People, people going through the rumbles, trying to figure it out if there's anything left. The initial earthquake's magnitude was registered at 7.8. It was followed by continuous aftershocks within 15 to 20 minute intervals. Aftershocks can occur from days to weeks to, to months and sometimes even years after the main shock. So, I mean, it's, it's within the time period for sure to expect aftershocks like this. The capital city of Kathmandu, situated on a block of crust around 120 kilometers wide and 60 kilometers long, reportedly shifted three meters to the south in under 30 seconds. Thanks to this breathtaking footage, we can eyewitness this terrible tragedy.
Then, two weeks after the devastating quake in which more than 8,000 people were killed, Nepal was hit by another major earthquake. This one with a magnitude of 7.3. This time, over 100 people were killed and thousands injured. There was widespread damage to buildings and property in much of the shell-shocked nation. Earthquakes have always been with us, but it is really only in the last 50 years or so that their devastating impact has been captured so vividly, not only in photographs, but in moving images broadcast around the world, at first via television, and in the last 20 years or so, over the internet. Sichuan, the second largest of the Chinese provinces. It is located in the upper Yangtze River Valley in the southwestern part of the country. The Sichuan Province earthquake of May 2008. It occurred on a weekday in the middle of the afternoon. School and university classes were in full swing. Office workers had returned to their desks after lunch. 80 kilometers from the 7.6 million person megacity of Chengdu, a fault line began to rupture. Are you the current emergency Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free, no subscription required. Download Beely now. resulting 7.9 magnitude earthquake in western China's mountainous Sichuan province would kill well over 8,000 people. Suddenly the ground just shaped. There was this awful noise and at first we thought maybe somewhere there was a landslide or something we never imagined it was an earthquake they just wouldn't stop they got louder and louder and the rocks were just being thrown down the mountains at us <laughs> About 4,800,000 people were left homeless, and the scale of damage to property was estimated to be over $80 billion. When a disaster occurs on this sort of scale, it is hard to single out any one statistic as especially grim. Because the earthquake occurred in shallow, that means about 10 kilometers uh, beneath the ground. Uh, so the damage is usually uh, very strong, uh, devastating. In the 2008 Sichuan province earthquake, an estimated 10,000 children were trapped under rubble when school buildings collapsed. many would die there. Unsurprisingly, there was a public outcry. A subsequent government investigation concluded that one in five primary schools may have been shoddily constructed and unsafe. For months after the quake, 
more than 20,000 students had to do with makeshift schools and classrooms. But reconstruction efforts went ahead with impressive speed. But no amount of reconstruction could erase the memories of those desperate hours in May 2008. But what causes earthquakes? When people talk about a seismic shift, what are they actually talking about? At the very bottom of the oceans lie the uppermost layers of the surface of our planet. The Earth's outer layer is known as the crust. The crust covers the Earth's surface a bit like a cracked eggshell. The various pieces that make up the crust are called geological or tectonic plates. The tectonic plates fit together a bit like a jigsaw puzzle with some rough edges known more scientifically as fault lines. The tectonic plates move continuously against one another. Most of the time they glide and slide along quite smoothly. Otherwise, there would be even more earthquakes. But every now and then, the tectonic plates catch and the pressure gradually but steadily builds up. Finally, the pressure becomes too much and the huge masses of rock which form the plates abruptly shift along the fault lines. This creates phenomenal waves of energy, spreading out in concentric circles, rather like waves in a pond if you throw a stone into the water. Recently, especially the Japanese scientists, uh, considering their past experience in earthquake prediction, they gave up uh, to make investment on earthquake prediction and that's why they concentrated on studies related to understand the physics of earthquakes. Most earthquakes take place within the so-called ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean. At least once a year, Alaska experiences a 7.0 earthquake. California alone gets about 10,000 quakes a year, but most go unnoticed except by seismographs. Researchers at UC Berkeley are testing a prototype of an earthquake early warning system that California is pursuing years after places like Mexico and Japan already have them up and running. It detects the very beginnings of earthquakes using seismometers very close to the epicenter and then predicts the shaking that's going to follow so that you can push out a warning to all of those in harm's way. Indeed, while it is thought that globally there are as many as half a million earthquakes every year, only around 100,000 register on the Richter scale, and only about 100 of these cause any visible damage. It was during the first golden age of television, on an evening in May of 1960 in Chile, as this newsreel footage shows that all hell broke loose. Rubble and ruin in the Pacific port of Concepcion in Chile, where she has suffered the worst series of earthquakes in all its history. Details of the damage cannot reveal the extent... The 1960 earthquake in Chile was the largest of the 20th century. The so-called rupture zone was estimated to be around 1,000 kilometers in diameter, from Lebu in central Chile to Puerto Aysen in the extreme south of the country. The severest destruction in Chile occurred in the Valdivia-Puerto Montt coastal region. Practically every building in the port town of Puerto Saavedra was destroyed by waves reaching heights of 11.5 meters, which carried the remains of houses as far as three kilometers inland. Most of the casualties in Chile and beyond were the result of large tsunamis triggered by the initial quake. As touched on, 
the so-called rupture zone was some 1,000 square kilometers, but the reverberations were literally felt across the Pacific Ocean. There was destruction on Easter Island, in the Samoa Islands, and in California. In the destruction wrought by the 1960 earthquake, not only in Chile, but across the Pacific, the final death toll was 1,655 people. In terms of sheer human cost, the worst earthquake of modern times occurred in Haiti on a January evening of 2010. Death toll estimates begin at about 220,000 people. By the end of the day, at least 52 aftershocks measuring 4.5 or greater had been recorded. An estimated 3 million people were affected by the quake. Haitian government sources estimated that 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings collapsed or were severely damaged. The earthquake caused major damage in Port-au-Prince, Jacmel and other settlements in the region. Several notable landmark buildings were significantly damaged or completely demolished, including the Presidential Palace, the National Assembly Building, and the Port-au-Prince Cathedral. I think in, uh, in the next few days, people are going to be running out of food, out of water. I think we need help because it's urgent. The mortuaries of Port-au-Prince were overwhelmed with tens of thousands of bodies, which had to be buried in mass graves. As rescue efforts tailed off, vital supplies, medical care, and sanitation were all in short supply. It's a very shallow earthquake, and the, uh, that very shallow depth, coupled with the uh, size of the earthquake, meant that there was a very strong ground shaking. Actually, that fault is pretty similar to the San Andreas fault in the sense that it, uh, it's what we call a strike-slip fault, where one side moves past the other in a horizontal fashion. Any major natural disaster brings tragedy. But in the case of Haiti, it seemed a particularly cruel twist of fate. Before the earthquake of 2010, Haiti was already a pretty desperate sort of place. To give some idea, only a third of the people in Port-au-Prince had regular access to drinking water. The island nation was 145th of 169 countries in the UN Human Development Index, making it the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. So when epic disaster struck, the Haitians were not well prepared, to put it mildly. Delays in aid distribution led to protests from aid workers and survivors. There were instances of looting and outbursts of violence. The US and many other countries eventually responded to appeals for humanitarian aid. I have directed my administration to respond with a swift, coordinated and aggressive effort to save lives. Practically all of Haiti's somewhat backwards communication systems, air, land and sea transport facilities, hospitals and electrical networks had been damaged by the earthquake. The almost non-existent infrastructure and arguably some condescending attitudes on the part of relief agencies seemed to hamper rescue and aid efforts with logistical problems such as air traffic congestion making matters still worse. Usually we have 150 doctors for the hospital. Now I don't have 20. And yet, even in spite of recent political unrest, 
the indomitable island nation of Haiti has recovered to a perhaps unexpected degree. Most of the 1.5 million people displaced by the earthquake and living in makeshift tents now live in acceptable housing conditions. Haiti's reconstruction program is in full swing. Throughout Haiti, ambitious infrastructure programs are visible, including roads, bridges, and social housing projects. Like beleaguered Haiti, you would think that Kashmir, the setting of a prolonged, sometimes violent border dispute between India and Pakistan, already had enough problems. But a massive earthquake on October 8, 2005, only added to the province's woes. The devastating earthquake shook the Western Himalayas and adjoining regions in the morning. magnitude 7.6 earthquake. It killed something like 80,000 people, injuring tens of thousands, and caused extensive damage in northern Pakistan, leaving millions homeless. I've lost my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, his wife, his little baby child of eight months we've heard, my aunt, my three uncles, his son. A reported 32,335 buildings collapsed in Kashmir and in Pakistan in places as far away from each other as Islamabad, Lahore and Rawalpindi. Across the border in India, at least 1,300 people were killed and 6,000 injured. The international response was fast, but the remote mountainous terrain that typifies Kashmir just served to compound problems for recovery efforts, with rescue teams struggling to reach the injured. As you can see, it's total devastation, and uh, we're here to do what we can. We've just taken a one live man from the house behind me now and he's off to hospital, so we're gonna pack up our stuff and go and look for somewhere else now. We're struggling because of the remoteness, we're struggling because of logistics, we're now struggling because of the weather and the terrain. You know, as a, as a human being, as a human pro professional, these are absolutely desperate times. You know, we had torrential rain last night. I spoke to the general this morning at 2,000 meters here, which isn't far from here. Uh, temperature was minus three. These people were outside, they were wet, they're now cold. We're going to have people dying, we're going to have people coming down with diseases. Landslides and rockfalls damaged or destroyed mountain roads and highways, cutting off access to the region for several days. Even with today's technology, such as laser beams which detect plate movement and a machine called a seismometer, earthquakes are still difficult to predict. As for being prepared, earthquake-proof buildings and roads, plus training in earthquake drills, all have their merits. Many a life has been saved in this way. But there are limits, especially when you take into account the awesome power of nature. Learning to live each day in the knowledge that desperate hours might just be around the corner is a vital part of what makes life so precious.